So, and my second question is, um, you know, people have mentioned a particular objection or question that's kind of become more popular, I guess, in um, the Protestant Catholic debate, and it's yeah. a passage in First Clement chapter thirty-two, verse four, where Clement seems to say. And I'll read the verse verbatim uh, eventually, but just to summarize it beforehand, it seems that Clement is saying that um, our works don't contribute at all to justification. And not even if they're from the holiness of our hearts. And, you know, we know that all holiness comes from God. And so if even if we grant the Catholic premise, right, that we are, you know, hitting initial justification, we're made holy by God. Our, Clement's saying our works still don't contribute to justification, maybe not even final justification in, in the Catholic paradigm. So yeah. let me quickly read it. So I'm yeah. reading from Holmes, Michael Holmes' translation, uh, third edition. So just uh, verse four, it says uh, from First Clement, And so we, having been called through his will in Christ Jesus, are not justified through ourselves or through our own wisdom or understanding or piety or works that we have done in holiness of heart, but through faith, by which the Almighty God has justified all who have existed from the beginning, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. I don't know, man. That sounds pretty devastating to me. What do you got to say in response? I'm I'm devastated. (laughs) Uh, You know what's awesome? Um, This is one of the things that I, um, you know, I think having, having, you know, pretty deep roots, both on kind of Protestant and Catholic sides Mm -hmm. of, of the divide, I think when I was initially, um, you know, working through some stuff on like the new perspective on Paul, Mm -hmm. I remember, um, you know, just kind of thinking back and forth. It's like, okay, if it's not this, does this mean this over here? Does this not mean this? Does this mean this over here? And I think um, having a, um, you know, having having pretty fundamentally Protestant DNA, um, I think I, I tend to think in you know, or tended to think in, you know, in, term, in terms of, you know, either or. So it's either, either this thing, you know, or this thing. It's kind of, you know, one, one or, the, or the other. And I remember there were certain, certain things that struck me as, as surprising then. So this is going back to when I was just, a, you know, a, a grad student re- reading college is when I first started to, you know, engage Clement. And how it was that Clement was interestingly doing this both and thing, mm-hmm. where Clement, he has these, really clear affirmations that salvation comes from God, not from anything that we do, that, you know, saving grace come, comes from him. Um, and then he has these really clear affirmations, which, I mean, interestingly, are even, even more frequent in first, first Clement, um, of humanity's accountability before God, and how it is that, you know, you know, all of humanity, and actually especially believers, are accountable for the works that we do are going to be judged, you know, strictly, you know, in, in accordance with, with our works. Mm-hmm. And I remember just thinking, this is really interesting because I'm, I am sort of, uh, almost from a standpoint of disposition and mm-hmm. hearing the way that these debates, you know, work, which granted, like, you know, as a young person, isn't always like the, the best nuance, but I'm used to thinking in terms of either you're saved by like kind of faith and grace Mm -hmm. or you're saved by works and whatever this happens to be. And that's kind of an either or paradigm. So if you're not on the, you know, if you're not on the red team, you're on, you're on the, you're on the the blue team. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting how I had difficulty fitting Clement into that either or paradigm Mm -hmm. because of the really clear insistence of the complete gratuity of salvation as far as you know god you know giving salvation to those who don't deserve it and then also not just the you know the the maintenance of a kind of accountability but actually a heightened accountability Mm -hmm. that one receives and it was interesting because you know you you know we're talking about this last night i remember the first time i read the council of trent and having actually a similar experience Mm -hmm. to reading first clement where I, I mean, I guess I didn't really have any idea what to hear the you know, count, Council of, uh, of, of Trent. Um, uh, Swan and I were, were hanging out with a, a bunch of uh, uh, Protestant pastor friends earlier today. Mm-hmm. And I was just, I was recounting the story of, uh, you know, growing up, it's like, you hear the story of, um, you know, before Council of Trent, it's possible for a Catholic to be saved. But after the Council of yeah. Trent, if you are then, a, you know, a Catholic after that, 
well then you like you you know you had to do something else in order to be saved you had to go mm-hmm. and leave or something which is interesting because that kind of seems like a work but anyway I, it was kind of confusing to me uh, and I didn't really know what what to what to expect besides you know this seems like a weird kind of scary thing and mm-hmm. I remember reading the Council of Trent and thinking geez how reformed this sounds in a sense yeah like it um, I mean it sounded like more reformed than I was at the time when mm-hmm. I first uh, you know when I, when I first first read it and um but what it was doing is it had this both and and that it had both sides as far as the complete gratuity of salvation mm-hmm. and then the way in which that salvation is intended to create within us a new life so that we actually do you know, to use St. Paul's language we, we become a new creation mm-hmm. and that this new creation whether we actually do become this or not whether again use Paul's language whether his grace to us is in vain or not, which mm-hmm. is you know, 1 Corinthians 15, that's ultimately of, of consequence. Mm-hmm. Um, but the source of grace isn't anything that we that we do. And I think that that's actually, the foundations from that, I think, aren't simply, they're not simply Pauline. Mm-hmm. I think that you can go, I think you can go to Christ pretty easily. I think you can go to the Old Testament as well. I think you can go to Deuteronomy 9. You can go to Daniel 9. I think you can go to, I mean, kind of Ezekiel. I mean, all over the place. Whenever you have an oracle of hope in Ezekiel, it's pretty clear this is not because of you. Yeah. Whenever mm-hmm. there is going to be salvation that comes from me, it is not, it's not going to be because, because you deserve it. It's going to be because of, you know, God's own, own righteousness. He's, he's going to act. Um, so one of the things that in, in my book, um, I, so in the, in the first, first edition, I talk about the broader paradigm of soteriology, the broader mm-hmm. uh, kind of, uh, you know, how it is that salvation under, is, is understood to work, and then how it is that the debate regarding works of the law functions as a sort of subset within that. And so mm-hmm. um, there's a section in the, in the first edition, and then in the, in the second edition with, with InterVarsity, um, I, uh, I, I, I expanded on that a bit because it was originally something where uh, I wanted to you know, create something as like an appendix to just expand and do like a, a fuller version of it. And then, I mean, thank God, the, you know, working with InterVarsity, yeah. you know, it gave me an opportunity to, to do that expansion, but to do the expansion in the front and on the back. So is mm-hmm. it okay if I read just a little bit? Of course, awesome. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so this is from the, the preface to the, the InterVarsity edition. This is, I, I briefly talked about the three things I wanted to expand on. So the first is on the broader patristic framework of uh, salvation described on page 279 that, quote, initial justification is completely by grace apart from works of any sort, and that final judgment or final justification is based on the outworking of this grace in one's subsequent life, mm-hmm. end quote. These two sides of this patristic framework can be well illustrated using Jesus' parable of the unmerciful servant as an analogy. While the servant is granted an inconceivable gift simply by his petition, without being able to give anything, this gift is meant to be transformative in the servant's life. When the servant is judged according to his deeds, which have manifestly not been transformed by the king's mercy, all that remains for the servant is severe judgment. So I think it's sort of Matthew, Matthew 18, which mm-hmm. is a little scary. Um, a helpful example of this framework is found in Irenaeus' Against Heresies, and you know, so it's book four and then chapter 27. Mm-hmm. Irenaeus describes how Old Testament figures merited less punishment for their sins since they acted apart from the Spirit's empowerment, and those in the New Covenant should not despise them for their faults since neither they nor we are justified by ourselves, but rather by Christ's advent. On the other hand, those in the New Covenant are now held accountable at a higher level, having now been the recipients of this saving power, to which the patriarchs only looked forward. Recognizing that most will be demanded of those to whom Christ has given the most, Irenaeus counsels his readers not to judge these prior figures, but rather to fear lest we be cut off, which he illustrates using Paul's image of the olive tree from Romans 11. Such a framework underlies discussions on salvation in patristic sources, in which statements of salvation by grace and judgment by works 
are regularly presented with great emphasis in the same sources, and even in the same passages. So along with the examples noted in the book, 1 Clement 30 to 35, so the one you've noted, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. Polycarp 1 2, see the striking passage in the earliest preserved Christian homily, 2 Clement 1 through 4. So you've got the, mm -hmm. the passage that you're talking about. So you've got um, 32 4, mm -hmm. which is in the context of 30 to 35. And you yeah. have within 30 to 35, you have these statements of you know pretty clear accountability judgment according to works. Mm -hmm. And then in the middle, you have 32. And you're like, how exactly do you? You know, do you fit these together? Right. Um, if and I can, if I can come in really just real quick, totally. yeah. I mean, I think what you're basically saying is like, you know, you don't just read First Clement thirty two four on its own as a kind of like a gotcha proof text, right? You have to look at the bigger picture of what's going on, and you're you're providing that comprehensive picture. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. I think. Um, I mean, one, I don't think that it's actually. I mean, it's not helpful practice in any yeah, instance right. to go yeah. these kind of gotcha. gotcha <laughs> um, you know, this it can be a bit like talking about. Uh, you know, talk about the New Testament with Muslim friends. Sure. Like, there's yeah. like one or two lines for the New Testament that always kind of comes back to you. It's like, you know, in context, that's not exactly like what's what's, sure. what's going going on there. And so you want to you want to be careful to attend to the mm -hmm. context of whatever whatever it is that that you're reading. Um, and I think if you you know like uh, this is something where um, you know my my original work work in this was um, it was. You know, defending first comment from you know Protestant critics who were basically saying, yeah, you know, there's this guy doesn't he doesn't get it he doesn't he's trying mm -hmm. to mix, you know, kind of a, you know Pauline and you know kind of Jacobite perspectives so you know drawing drawing from for James, um, it's this kind of sola fideism mixed with with synergism mm -hmm. that doesn't make sense you know a, a good example of this is um is T F Torrance. Mm -hmm. uh, his doctrine, uh, doctrine of grace and the apostolic fathers, which he wrote as his, his dissertation under Karl Barth. Um, I mean, I think he's astute actually mm -hmm. in saying, you know, Clement, from, from Torrance's standpoint, the pure kind of reformed understanding of how it is that grace is supposed to work. You know, he looks at 30, you know, 32, four and says, yeah. this, this looks like something we want to say, but when you put it in context, oh. you see, it doesn't actually match up with how it is that we understand, you know, this to work. And I think that actually, um, I think that, that Torrance is, you know, is, 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 is astute on that. Um, what I, you know, first getting into Clement, what I try to do is um, follow, uh, this is, you know, by N.T. Wright, you know, Ernest Kaysen, who says, you know, you got to assume that there is an inner logic to the text, mm -hmm. even if you can't necessarily find it, you know, on, on, you know initially. Mm -hmm. You have to assume that there's some logic according to which this, this, this makes sense, uh, mm -hmm. which I, I thought you know a lot of the um, a lot of the more Protestant critics of Clement weren't really doing. They just sort of thought he was this confused kind of muddle-headed compiler. He was just taking things that sounded very you know vaguely biblical and putting them all together. Sure, yeah. And I don't think that you need to to do that because I think that the sociological paradigm that you see in First Clement and Second Clement here in Polycarp, you just see throughout patristic sources. I wow. think it's, it's held really consistently. So mm -hmm. I'll, I'll read the rest of the um, sure. the rest of mm -hmm. the, the paragraph here because it just fills out the rest of the point. So um, so you have the salvation by grace and judgment by work, works passages, yeah. which are not just in the same sources, but even in the same passages right next to each other. And again, mm -hmm. Second Clement, um, you know, it's the earliest preserved homily that we have outside of the canon of the New Testament. And the first, you know, four chapters of that are a great example of that. Of mm -hmm. like our complete dependence on God for salvation, and also the accountability that we have as those who have received, you know, received this grace. The lack of tension between these principles becomes clear when it is recognized that these sources regard God's grace as transformative, so that one is enabled to live in a way that would be judged favorably at the last day. To paraphrase a later line from Augustine that corresponds with the testimony of these early sources, God's justifying grace turns an ungodly man into a godly one, and one who disregards this power will be held more strictly accountable than one who has never known it. And then within this broader soteriological framework, early patristic sources regard the Mosaic Law's distinctive works as having no decisive role, and then this is quoting again from page 279 of the book, either as bearers of the grace of salvation or somehow prerequisite for it, mm -hmm. pre prerequisites for it, or as criteria that will have any kind of significance at the last judgment. Mm -hmm. So you can see how it is 
you have a broader soteriological framework, and then you have the works of the law as a kind of subset debate within that. Sure. So, could I could I just have you do one more thing? Yeah. So, um, I you know, baby Mike to sleep on me, so I can't really go anywhere. You yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> you you kept, yeah, you kept hostage in two different yeah. ways. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, they're talking briefly too about uh, Barclays unconditioned versus unconditional because I yeah. thought that distinction was really helpful. Even though last night at like midnight, I got the two mixed up, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> so you're on, you're on central, central time. Yeah, right, so right, right. Fine. Um, so, so yeah, I, I referred to that in the, uh, you know, in the preface to my book. And I honestly, I refer to it everywhere because I think that John's work is really fantastic. Yeah, John Barkley. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, um, and I think that, that, that distinction is really helpful, mm. um, that it, that grace for Paul and I think grace elsewhere in scripture is unconditioned in the sense of there are no prerequisites that one needs to have in order to receive it, mm -hmm. but not unconditional in the sense of carrying no future obligations. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's his his language, so I give him one hundred percent credit for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I I think that that's that's really helpful. So for any of your listeners um, who haven't had a chance to look at his book, I think especially. Um, I mean, they're both great. So Paul yeah. and the Power, so Paul and Giffen, Paul and Paul and the Power of Grace. Mm -hmm. I actually like Paul and the Power of Grace even even more, even though it's shorter. Yeah. I think yeah. it actually does even more. I just, it's an astonishingly sure. good book. Good book. So um, I, I I can't I can't mm -hmm. recommend it too too highly. You, you know, I was thinking about buying um, one or the other, and I decided to go Power of, uh, Paul and the Power of Grace. Yeah. So to hear you say that I picked the right one, yeah. even though it was the shorter and cheaper one, okay, yeah. I feel a lot better now. It's, it's really good. <laughs> he just he did a um, he did a fantastic job with it. Um, I wrote uh, I wrote a review uh, on it in, a, in in Mere Orthodoxy, which is yeah. a couple of little things. You know, I think I, I pushed him on that are just you know kind of more more for fun at, at mm. the end, but um, it's a tremendous piece of work and that I mean his 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 work is incredible. So yeah. um I, I should say as well with, with First Climate, um anybody you know who's, who's interested in this kind of stuff, um the uh so so uh so my friend Matt Halstead and I did a little like a written mm -hmm. interview on this where we went through um First Clement and the Epistle of Diognetus. Yeah. And um and uh, you know a few other fun fun things as well. But looking at some of the specific passages and how it is that uh, you know the logic mm -hmm. of you know these, these two sides are, are held together uh, within the, within the patristic framework, and so um, if you're interested, that's something I'm sure you could put like yeah. a link up some somewhere. So, well, Dr. Thomas, thank you so much for this interview. Um, I think this interview confirms that when I say two questions, I mean like yeah, two, but then with some questions <laughs> you know, baked into there. But thank you for your patience. Yeah, and your time.